Stepan Arkadyevich was a truthful man in his relations with himself. He was incapable of deceiving himself and persuading himself that he repented of his conduct. He couldn't at this date repent of the fact that he, handsome, susceptible man of 34, wasn't in love with his wife, the mother of five living and two dead children, and only a year younger than himself. All he repented of was that he hadn't succeeded better in hiding it from his wife. But he felt all the difficulty of his position and was sorry for his wife, his children and himself. Possibly he might have managed to conceal his sins better from his wife if he had anticipated that the knowledge of them would have had such an effect on her. He had never clearly thought out the subject, but he had vaguely conceived that his wife must long ago have suspected him of being unfaithful to her and shut her eyes to the fact he had even supposed that she were not woman, no longer young or good-looking and in no way remarkable or interesting. Merely a good mother ought from a sense of fairness to take an indulgent view. It had turned out quite the other way. Oh, it's awful. Oh, dear, it's awful. Stepan Arkadyevich kept repeating to himself when he could think of nothing to be done. And how well things were going up till now. How well we got on. She was contented and happy in her children. I never interfered with her in anything. I let her manage the children and the house just as she liked. It is true, it is bad, her having been a governess in our house. That is bad. There is something common and vulgar in flirting with one's governess. But what a governess! He vividly recalled the ruggish black eyes of Mademoiselle Roland and her smile. But after all, while she was in the house, I kept myself in hand. And the worst of it all is that she'd already, it seems as if ill luck would have it so. Oh, but what is to be done? There was no solution but that universal solution which life gives to all questions, even the most complex and insoluble. That answer is, one must live in the needs of the day, that is, forget oneself. To forget himself when sleep was impossible now, at least till night time. He couldn't go back now to the music sung by the decanter woman, so he must forget himself in the dream of daily life. Then we shall see, Stepan Arkadyevich said to himself. And getting up, he put on a grey dressing gown lined with blue silk, tied the tassels in a knot, and drawing a deep breath of air into his broad bare chest, he walked to the window with his usual confident step, turning out his feet that carried his full frame so easily. He pulled up the blind and rang the bell loudly. It was at once answered by the appearance of an old friend, his valet, Matli, covering his clothes, his boots and the telegram. Matli was followed by the barber with all the necessaries for shaving. Are there any papers from the office? asked Stepan Arkadyevich, taking the telegram and seating himself at the looking glass. On the table, replied Matli, glancing with inquiring sympathy at his master. And after a short pause, he added with a sly smile, they have sent from the carriage jobbers. Stepan Arkadyevich made no reply. He merely glanced at Matli in the looking-glass. In the glance in which their eyes met in the looking-glass, it was clear that they understood one another. Stepan Arkadyevich's eyes asked, Why do you tell me that? Don't you know? Matli put his hands in his jacket pockets, thrust out one leg and gazed silently, good-humoredly with a faint smile at his master. I told them to come on Sunday. Until then, not to trouble you or themselves. For nothing, he said. He had obviously prepared the sentence beforehand. Stepan Arkadyevich saw Matvey wanted to make a joke and attract attention to himself. During open telegram he read it through, guessing at the words, misspelled, as they always are in telegrams, and his face brightened. Matvey, my sister Anna will be here tomorrow, he said, checking for a minute the slick, plump hand of the barber, cutting pink path through his long curly whiskers. Thank God, said Matvey, showing by this response that he, like his master, realized the significance of this arrival that, is, that Anna, sister he was so fond of, might bring about reconciliation between husband and wife. Alone or with your husband, inquired Matvey. Stepan couldn't answer. The barber was at work on his upper lip, and he raised one finger. 
Matt, we noticed that the looking glass is the room to be got ready upstairs. Inform Daria where she orders Daria Alexandrovna. Matt, we repeated that though in doubt. Mm hmm. Inform her. Here. Take the telegram, give it to her, and then do what she tells you. You want to try it on, Matvi understood, but he only said yes, sir. Stepan Arkadyevich was already washed and combed and ready to be dressed when Matvi, stepping deliberately in his creaky boots, came back into the room with the telegram in his hand. The barber had gone. Daria Alexandrovna told me to inform you that she is going away. Let him do, that is you, as he likes. He said, laughing only with his eyes, and putting his hands in his pocket, he watched his master with his head on one side. Stepan was silent a minute. Then a good-humored and rather beautiful smile showed itself on his handsome face. Huh? Matvey, he said, shaking his head. It's all right, sir, she will come round, said Matvey. Come round. Mm-hmm. Do you think so? And who is there? asked Stepan Arkadyevich, hearing the rustle of a woman's dress at the door. It is I, said the firm, pleasant woman's voice, and the stern, fork-marked face of Matryona, the nurse, was thrust in at the doorway. Well, what is it? queried Stepan Arkadyevich, going up to her at the door. Although Stepan Arkadyevich was completely in the wrong as regards his wife, and was conscious of this himself, almost everyone in the house, even the nurse, was on his side. Well, what now? he asked disconsolately. Go to her, sir. Own your fault again. Maybe God will aid you. She's suffering, so it is sad to see. And besides, everything in the house is topsy-turvy. You must have pity, sir, and the children. Beg her forgiveness. There is no help for it. One must take the consequences. <laughs> but she will not see me. You just do your part. God is merciful. Pray to God, sir. Come, that will do. You can go, said Stepan, blushing suddenly. Well, now, do dress me, he turned to Matvi and threw off his dressing gown decisively. Matvi was already holding up the shirt like horse core, and blowing off some invisible speck, he slipped it with obvious pleasure over the well-groomed body of his master. <laughs>